Welcome to this State of the Arts conversation, a virtual edition today. Our topic is the together slash apart, exploring isolation and solitude during a time of COVID. My name is Jerome Weeks. I'm a senior arts reporter for KERA's Art and Seek. And I just want to remind uh, viewers on YouTube that any time during this conversation, if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, do so in the chat section directly below the video, and we'll try to get to them. Um, I'd like to introduce our three panelists uh, today. Uh, they are Joy Bollinger, uh, choreographer and artistic director of Bruce Wood Dance. Welcome, Joy. Hi, thank you. Ruben Carazan, a theater artist and uh, one of the creators of the stage piece, The Cube. Welcome, Ruben. Thanks for having me. And Shelby David Meyer, visual artist, whose work is currently on display at the Nasher Sculpture Center. Welcome, Shelby. Uh, just went down a few weeks ago, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is the first of three uh, State of the Arts presentations this spring that we're gonna do um, all on uh, questions concerning COVID, aspects of COVID's effect on uh, the arts and uh, their artworks. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit before we get to uh, our panelists about if, if you research that, if you research the effect of COVID on the arts, what you'll often find is uh, hundreds and hundreds of stories online that um, detail um, the data uh, that talk about, uh, you know, how many museums have closed, how many people have been put out of work because Broadway shut down, that kind of thing. Occasionally these articles will include you know, a single artist's perspective. They'll they'll uh, talk about how they have lost income or how long how they're no longer able to do what they truly love. Uh, but when you look back at major social, cultural, economic upheavals, the Great Depression, civil rights movement in the fifties and sixties, you generally don't think in terms of data. You think of the tremendous outpouring, the influence they've had on music movies, novels, magazines, just all of the art that was, was created in response to that. Um, so our conversation today is about that. Um, and it's gonna come down to a big two-part question. The second part, um, which we'll spend some time on, is, is going to be about how these artists have transmuted this experience into the art, their art, how it has affected them. Um, but the first part, the first uh, part of this two-part question is simply, what's been your personal experience? Perhaps you know someone who's, who's died of COVID. Perhaps you know someone who's come down with it. Uh, perhaps you had you know, huge career moves planned and it all got shelved. Um, so what have you experienced in terms of isolation, loss, solitude, all of that during COVID? I thought we'd start alphabetically. Joy? Yeah, for me personally, it was um, the loss of doing my job as it had been before. That was the first thing that was kind of ripped and quickly taken away. Uh, the loss of ability to work with dancers in a studio the inability to join together movement in the same place, in the same space. That was uh, the biggest impact. I had friends and family members that were affected by COVID. I did not lose anyone close to me, but uh, as we'll talk about later, some of the stories that surrounded me during that time of experiences other people had were deeply impactful and really um, let me understand kind of the serious journey that a lot of people experienced battling, battling the pandemic. Um, I have two small children, so I do have to say isolation for me wasn't as much about alone time as just being separated from my work environment and my freedom to have that creativity in the space with dancers and that contact and that uh, relationship with proximity to another person. I did have little bodies to hug and take care of all day. And that was um, probably a tremendous help to me, even though I didn't realize it at the time. 
but that was the most foreign part of the experience is having to stay away from that which I spend every day doing and pouring into and um, and just my mode of working completely, completely gone and changed. So interacting with dancers as a choreographer and artistic director, that is your, your clay, your paint, your canvas, that's everything. Right, right. And uh, my favorite part of my job is being in the studio with the dancers when we're working on something and coaching and trying things and having them relate to each other and contact, contact with another human being, imagine. Um, and it was all of these things were the biggest no nos of all time now. Uh, not a good, a horrible idea. Can't do it. Can't even think about doing it. When will we do it again? We don't know. And just kind of little um, anxiety that comes with that and the uncertainty that you just had to sit in for such a long time. Ruben, as a, as a performing artist, your experience must have been been similar. But how was it done uh, as, a, as a personal affair? Yeah. So. Um... You know, I'm a freelance theater artist here in town, and so um, I don't really uh, have a day job. And I, I also I live alone, and I'm also not a very social being to begin with. And so, um, uh, in some ways, you would think that you know, you know, being locked up in my apartment would be nice, you know, since I don't generally like being around around uh, large groups of people. But uh, theater was my only outlet that I had. Um, and so, to suddenly lose all of that, you know, in addition to the the loss of income, uh, was also you know, it, it's true, I think, for everyone, but it was it was hard kind of like mentally and emotionally. Um, I went back home to Miami to be with my family, my parents and my sister and my nephews for what I thought was going to be two weeks until all of this kind of like blew over. I ended up staying there for six months and then, you know, I just kept waiting for things to get back to normal in Dallas. And then I realized it's not going to happen. Um, so I'm going to need to figure something out. And so I came back here. Um, tried to find ways to keep my mind engaged, started learning to play the piano. <laughs> um, and then eventually uh, started, you know, groups started kind of like innovating and I started finding ways to um, do something that was not exactly like what I was used to before the pandemic, but but that came close enough and that was exciting and challenging. Um, but uh, yeah, for those... Um, uh, it's, it, I mean, it's been hard not being able to interact with other people. And, you know, similar to what Joy was saying, um, being in a space with other human beings, not just the people on stage, but the audience, um, that's, that's the only thing I had, like every friend that I've ever had has been through, through the theater. And so, um, losing that, um, yeah, it was, it was really tough. It's Shelby. As the, the visual artist here, you're often seen as pretty much a, a, a solo affair. Yeah. Um, but uh, so was this uh, a welcome solitude, a welcome isolation? Nothing changed or did um, it in fact disrupt sorry, things? I had messed around. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I definitely think it did disrupt things a little bit. I think I think it um, just kind of the mindset of everything kind of shifted, you know, when all of a sudden you have to kind of question everywhere you're going and kind of just think about your own safety every day. <laughs> it's a little disconcerting, you know, when that mindset kind of happens. So um i think for me it kind of it felt like there were a lot of kind of distractions um maybe like it seems like the opposite where like i was able to go throughout my day and just kind of maybe look for an escape um that was kind of like the the day-to-day -day thing but kind of when you're back home it's kind of a you have to find a different way to kind of change your mindset i think so a lot of my working shifted also uh my day job or not day job but another uh, job i have is i'm also an art handler so a lot of my income kind of <laughs> went away uh, when museums shut down and there weren't any shows and people weren't um, inviting people to their homes and I saw artwork like that. So uh, that also kind of a lot of my day to day routines kind of also went away with that, too. So um, it felt like one of those like this might be a great opportunity. And then when I really sat with it, everything kind of froze up. So I think it was more like a mental kind of <laughs> freeze or something for me. As a visual artist in your art practice, do you interact with others or is it really a, entirely a solo? Affair. Um, I mean, right now for me, so I share a studio, and so um, when all that happens, um, studio sharing didn't really happen as much. Um, there's someone there full time where I where I studio, so I kind of I and my partner that I live with, she she's a healthcare worker, so at the beginning of the whole 
pandemic, a lot of us kind of like, well, I don't know what I'm coming in contact with. I'll stay home. And so that's kind of what led me to these envelope drawings. There are a few projects that I always work at home and stuff, and I try to work solo most of the time in the first place. But not having a studio um, that I like to kind of migrate to or kind of have a separation between live and work uh, kind of shook me up for a bit, for sure. Mm-hmm. Staying at home, there's a lot of distractions and a lot of yes. stuff like that. So that's, that's the main reason I like to have someplace mm-hmm. else to work. Um, Ruben, um, to return to you and, and, and your successful attempt to get something like theater going, if you could uh, talk to us about what led to the cube um, and to the, uh, the creation of this unusual work of art and to help the uh, viewers uh, understand, we're gonna uh, run this short video that was created by Karen Carrion of uh, KERA. Friends, health, community, live theatrical performance, real human connection. Remember that? I've heard it's quite nice. I wouldn't know. I'm just a big glowing cube. But you, you are made of flesh and of bone, blood and muscle. Me, big glowing cube, us, here, now. What did you expect would happen? Did you come to be entertained? Were you expecting music and dance? I hope I have not disappointed. Why? Why did you come to me? How does it feel to be alone? I wouldn't know. Big glowing cubes cannot feel anything. So Ruben, uh, a number of performing arts groups like the the Dallas Symphony went into uh, live performance, returned to live performance with socially uh, distanced and extremely reduced audiences. You took that to an extreme, just three people in a plastic box on stage for each performance. How did you get to that? Um, So, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, theaters and theater artists, um, most of them turned to like virtual offerings, doing things over Zoom. And um, uh, early on, I, I did one of those and realized that, you know, my strengths, what make me a good performer, didn't necessarily translate to, you know, a computer screen. Um, and so I, I said, I wasn't going to do another one of those because I just felt like I wasn't doing good work and I couldn't imagine that the audience was enjoying what I was, you know, producing. Um, so my good friend, Jeffrey Moffat, who has a background in theater, um, but has recently been working a lot with art installations and projections, uh, reached out to me and suggested that we create some kind of experience that could get people out of their homes. Um, we create a, uh, a structure with projection screens for walls that audiences could walk into and they would be immersed in video and images. And, um, and so I, we, we brainstormed for a bit and then I went off for a couple of weeks and wrote the script. And really what I wanted to do is I knew that if we were going to do something live, it, it couldn't be something that asked the audience. It, it had to be a, a piece that um, was aware of the historical and social context in which we are currently living. Right. So it couldn't be enough to like, I don't know, do Romeo and Juliet, but the actors just happen to be wearing masks. You know, that's doesn't um, it, it's asking the audience to suspend their disbelief a little bit too much. It's asking them to detach from reality um, to an extent that I, as a performer, as a creator, don't feel comfortable asking the audience to do. And so I knew that the piece needed to be not necessarily about COVID, but needed to be aware of COVID. And it's a piece that I would not have created were it not for um the pandemic. And um, so we were trying to kind of like straddle that line between, you know, the virtual and and the live safe while also having live performers. And um, and so that's where the cube came from. When I when I spoke to uh, the composer musician that you worked with, Nigel Newton, um, about collaborating on this work, and it was done almost entirely, you guys collaborate almost entirely through texts and, and Zoom meetings, that kind of thing. You only met 
in person just a few days before, before you opened. But he said that the, the two key words that you gave him that he remembered uh, for the music were loneliness and joy. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, I think um, loneliness is what I felt the most, you know, <laughs> over the past couple of, uh, of months. Um, uh, I mean, I'm a pretty lonely person to begin with. I like loneliness, um, but I like um, uh, being able to choose when I'm lonely. And this was kind of like loneliness that was forced upon me um, and that uh, that made it harder. And but and so when I reached out to Nigel, our composer, and to Emily Burnett, our choreographer and dancer, um, you know, I said that the the, the show should probably um, uh, explore that sensation um, of loneliness, but um, we also wanted to look at, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, and um, uh, we wanted it to be a piece that was hopeful, and so I think that's where, that's where joy came from, is we wanted the piece to end on kind of a high note, um, we didn't want it to be, you know, a total bummer from beginning to end. I was surprised uh, when you told me that having built this plastic cube, that the whole idea of the the kind of hospital isolation chamber had never really entered your head. Yeah, that was something that you said when you when you stopped by to to interview us. Um, you know, we wanted the audience to feel isolated. Um, as they have been for the past couple of months. We wanted to kind of like replicate that. And there's a moment in the show where they're kind of like the show breaks down and the projectors go out, the lights go out, the audiences plunge into darkness, the sound cuts out. And we force the audience to sit that for like a while, you know? And I remember you particularly thought it was maybe too long. <laughs> it was like three minutes of silence and darkness. Um, because I thought maybe people would think the show's over. Oh, they did. People walked out. People people walked out during that section. Um, some people walked out because they thought the show was over. Some people walked out because it just wasn't what they had signed up for. You know, they thought it might have been, you know, an Instagrammable, you know, maybe like Sweet Tooth Hotel, something a little bit more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you've got this cube asking them to like question, you know, what does it mean to be a human and why do we crave human connection? And and then they're, you know, forced to sit in darkness for three minutes. Um, but um, uh, yeah, the, 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 I didn't realize, so those ideas of quarantine and isolation were, you know, um, built into the text from the very beginning. But the idea of a, a, an isolation chamber wasn't something that we had um, consciously thought of until you had, uh, you had brought it up. But once you brought it up and we, we ran with it and told everyone it was uh, on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shelby, um, I have uh, enjoyed your work, uh, but I have to say that, that I'm, I'm not, I, I don't see you having to transition much into no. isolation. Yeah, um, yeah I would say the envelopes really weren't that. like a, a, a response or any of this work was necessarily a response to, to what was happening. Um, I think maybe because a lot of my work um, in the last few years has kind of been trying to grasp with like ideas of of objects or things that are kind of are too hard to grasp or too big, something called like a hyper object, um, which is coined by a guy named Timothy Morton. Um, something like a so um, an earlier work that I was doing like in grad school was centered around the idea of like a black hole, you know, a super massive object in outer space that we couldn't that I couldn't necessarily wrap my head around, you know. <laughs> And making a and kind of basically I reference it by making holes in a in a wall or ceiling um, that are basically the, the event horizon of the planet. So if you were to make the Earth the density of a black hole would be about 18 millimeters um, across, like diameter wise. So I think for me, um, with this whole pandemic and the fact that it's kind of um, a global phenomenon, um, things are happening at a scale that are very hard to grasp. I think for me that kind of jump wasn't too big. Um, to make. So I think it's just some similar things kind of happen. I think that's just kind of the nature of the work too. The uh, It always struck me that your art could be seen as as uh, having an environmental theme because of so much mm -hmm. about, you know, discarded things. But precisely because they're discarded, they often seem to me kind of lonely. Um, right. Related. Uh, and uh, there's a certain amount of, of humor in some of your work, as with um, false security, with a security envelope that's been, been mm -hmm. told. And, um, there's a certain raw humor, but still there is a sense of, of human, the humans that aren't there. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of it is, 
this, uh, once you start to look at just kind of like one thing or isolated, you, and I think one of my favorite quotes, I'll, I'll step back, one of my favorite quotes is, in and of itself, nothing ever matters, but what really matters is nothing is ever in and of itself, <laughs> um, which is the idea is like, you can isolate something and it might start to mean nothing, but you start to realize everything's kind of connected. And the more you expand that, the more you start to realize everything's kind of uh, tied together. So I think, you know, with, with things we've, that have been happening this last year, we start to, we're starting to realize everything's tied together through strings and you pull one string it pulls something else. Um, I think. Have you, have you done work that is expressly about, the pandemic or is it just simply continuing in your print? No, you know, it's, it's not, yeah, it's also that and I also, you know, and it's sometimes I feel like I'm just not like a cop out, but sometimes I'm trying to make work that isn't specifically about one thing, you know, sometimes it's about kind of realizing art is like a place to kind of come to uh, and think about something and then kind of and see where, where you go with that. So sometimes I'm not trying to make something specifically about one thing, but something that kind of have different ideas attached to it. Kind of at the time or place you approach it. I mean, the sculpture uh, often is about a single isolated object that we yeah have, right um, yeah so and it and I itself sorry, that. I'm interrupt. that's all right. I was about to say it yeah does help to that yeah and I, and I think that's for me a big part of it is I really am interested in in sculpture and the way sculpture functions as an artwork um, that's been like a I've kind of pushed away imagery I don't it's I think for maybe for me it's kind of like a resistance to the kind of screen culture we live in and kind of how everything's so especially with this last year everything being on screens I still was kind of craving like physical just the world you know um I like to walk around my art <laughs> kind of do a 360 you kind of like have like an inner you know you can kind of dance with it it's a little bit the way I think of it sometimes it's having an object in front of you is a lot different than looking at a picture or or watching a performance or something have you ever visited a gallery or the National Sculpture Center to see people's responses, to see the interaction? Um, you know, I, I popped in a few weekends. And I mean, that's a big, one of my favorite things when I do opening. So I think having this is the first show I've done um, since since everything's uh, happened, you know, and uh, not being, not having like an opening or kind of like a place to like see people interact with the work is strange. Because for me, a little, a little bit of my, my enjoyment is seeing how many people take the time to actually recognize what it's made out of or what it is, how many people are, you know, too busy to walk and walk right past it or kind of um, don't give it the time that I think just the few seconds that maybe you might notice something that it's not, you know. Joy, um, you created a, a work called Life Interrupted uh, for Bruce Wood Dance uh, last fall. And um, the, um, the story behind it, the, the story that inspired it is is interesting. I was wondering if you could talk about that, about what led to life interrupted. Sure. Last fall, we were looking at doing a series of outdoor performances and then creating virtual content. We knew a lot of our audience members couldn't, couldn't go anywhere, uh, feel safe outside their homes. And so uh, this was new for us that we moved into dance film and looked at how we could reach people that way. And some lovely patrons and friends of the company had had this experience. Was, ter was terrifying and shocking. And the husband um, really had almost an out of body experience, feeling like he was battling darkness and then um, really on the edge of that darkness and kind of falling into this state of surrender, he felt that even though there was this incredible distance um, from his wife and his family and their friends, he felt that as his body began to recover in the very last um, days of him battling it, he felt surrounded by this wholeness of people who uh, come to find out overseas were sending thoughts and prayers for him. His family and friends here in this country were sending thoughts and prayers. So we have this beautiful piece of music created by composer Joseph Falcon. We have the story of this couple and um, I choreographed a work that kind of covered their journey and experience from this happy abandoned bliss that they were on this lovely trip into complete 
earth shattering separation, isolation, fear, darkness, and then kind of coming out of that as a changed person to kind of a new sense of wholeness. And um, despite the separation, having a really strong feeling of community and connectivity with people that were miles and miles away and never even got to speak to him or see him, but knowing that they were there and that was something that strengthened him back to wholeness. So it was really extraordinary story. Um, and uh, we were able to create a short film with our videographers, the DGBs, and, uh, and share that last November with our audiences. Let's see a, an excerpt from Life Interrupted, choreographed by Joy Bollinger. Now, Joy, with Ruben's piece, he created a work that uh, everything was very small scale and isolated throughout for the, the performers, the artists, the audience. But you created, in essence, a, a film, um, a short film. Uh, I could see the, the performers were wearing masks, but how was that managed, all of that, that that we saw? Was all that done in pieces? Uh, yes, some of it was done in pieces um, when we had we felt comfortable when we had solo moments, when we were in a group setting, especially indoors, we used masks. That worked best for this piece because it was about COVID. We had other works on our program that were not about this. And so we filmed those outdoors with as much separation and short periods of, of contact as possible so that we could be uh, free from the masks. But yes, um, our, our studio protocols during this time have been very extreme and um, filming, luckily you can, you can get intimacy from a camera that we couldn't achieve in, uh, in our physicality, in our physical, you know, separation and existence in the space, but the camera could help us with that. So dance film became essential for us sharing our stories in the way we wanted to during this time. You said earlier about uh, missing that interaction um, with dancers uh, and being in the space. Did this satisfy some of that? Although there was different constraints, did this satisfy that impulse? It did. It did. I think as we tiptoed back into the studio last fall, uh, along with the, the kind of nervous sense of how are we gonna do this and what's gonna actually work, there was just a joy and excitement to just be in the space, even if it was only a few people at a time, even if we were standing 10 feet apart with mask on, no contact, you know, it was okay, we're here, we get to just see each other across the room. And even though we're further apart than normal, we can feel what the other person is doing physically. And we started realizing what we could do with those boundaries in place and finding ways to challenge ourselves to think about what we could offer our audience uh, with those boundaries in place. Ruben uh, earlier talked about um, ending on a note of joy. Um, was um, that one of the things that attracted you about this is it wasn't just a complete bummer. Um, everyone winds up isolated and lost, um, that there was a recovery. Yeah, it, that was a really beautiful part to this story. I think um, Mark Dietz specifically had a very almost out-of-body spiritual experience. And he said, I came out of this experience a new person. 
I, I, I am different. I'm forever changed by this. Um, and I, I look, I want to share the happiness and the joy. I want to share hope. I want to share um, this sense of community and that there, there is something to hold on to here. And uh, it, it's a really, it was just a beautiful story, um, especially, especially because they came out of it not back to the usual, but in a new and different place that was filled with those feelings, even after such a, you know, difficult journey. Um, viewers uh, on YouTube, uh, just a reminder that if you wish to comment or ask questions, you can do so in the comment section directly underneath um, the video. Um, I wanted to ask you, Ruben, the same question I just asked Joy, was the experience of doing the cube um, satisfy your, your theater urge? Was that, a, was that enough? Is that, un, and is that something that you want to replicate under those circumstances in the future? Is this a going ahead enough for you? Um, it, it definitely satisfied some of, some of that need, um, you know, getting to interact with, with audiences and being in the same space with other performers. Um, uh, you know, the kind of, um, in some ways it was completely different because you know we the performers we couldn't um after a show we couldn't like go out for drinks or something like we we didn't interact i don't i didn't really get to know them all that well do you know what i mean um uh but i think the way one of the things i really crave about theater and about live performance is the fact that it's live and that if um there's a certain um anxiety or stress to something going wrong. And, um, and with a show like this, lots of things went wrong. You know, I mean, Jerome, the, the day that you were, that you came to interview us, the entire cube just broke, yes. just fell yes. apart, just, uh, just obliterated into a million pieces. That and didn't happen design, again, did it? That didn't happen. No, never, never happened again. We, you know, we, we fixed it and made sure that it would never, <laughs> that that was a one-time thing. But, uh, you know, our set designer, Jeffrey, um, who also helped to conceive of the show, ran off to Home Depot and had to rebuild the frame. And um, luckily we had it back up in two or three minutes. Um, but there was a number of times during the show where like a projector would go out or the power went out one day in the middle of a performance. And that kind of stuff, um, just kind of like fuels me when I'm in performance. Um, uh, you know, getting to see the, how the audience would interact differently. There is a, a level of um, uh, interaction in the show where the audience is being asked to say things. And um, I, as a performer and as an audience member, I hate audience interaction. Um, but um, I don't know. It's something that made its way into the show. And, and getting to see that aspect of it. Um, getting to see how audiences, different audiences would respond to it. That again, also kind of like fueled me and made each performance feel uh, different. So it, it definitely satisfied some of it. Will I do it again? I, I don't know. This show seems so specific to the moment that even if we were to do it, you know, some people after the second run, because both runs were sold out, some people wanted us to bring it back a third time, you know, because tickets were so limited. Um, and I thought even if we were to do this in May, I already feel like some of the things in the show are no longer really as relevant. Um, there's, uh, there's some live performances going on already. So I think that reveal halfway through the show of live performers, it wouldn't be as impactful even now. Um, we have a viewer with an interesting question. Uh, Michael Buss asks, what would your practice look like had COVID not upended our lives? Has this sparked a new focus area and path forward? Or will you likely revert back to your past themes, media, practices? That's for all three of you. Um, Ruben, I was just asking you that question. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, a part of me, I love what I love. I'm boring. I love traditional theater. Do you know what I mean? Like, I love um, a clear distinction between the audience and the performers. I like intimate spaces, yes. Um, but um, I like living room dramas, you know, just like people being human beings in living room. Like, that's that's my thing. I was I was kind of like raised on linear narratives. I'm boring, you know? And and I was I had a bunch of those kinds of projects lined up before the pandemic. They all disappeared. Um, a part of me wants to go back to those um, because that's what I love. That I, I love dialogue. Um, uh, but um, this was the first time that I ever, you know, there's a moment in the show where I monologue to the audience and like my face is like projected onto the back wall um, and there's like a live feed and I'm speaking to the audience very frankly about my experiences over, you know, the past year. Um, 
I've never done anything like that. I never spoken my words on a stage before. I've never written a, something that was specifically about me. Um, there was something, uh, I don't know. I hate to word, say that we use the word therapeutic, but, but it was, it was moving in a way that, um, other projects had never been. It was challenging in a way that other projects had never been. Some of that might make its way into some of my work moving forward. But um, I, I'm also kind of like looking forward to um, to going back to the way things were. And I don't know if that makes me a terrible person. You know, <laughs> I, I, I know we're supposed to all learn something from the past year. Um, but uh, I, I really I really miss I really miss uh, what I used to do. Joy, um, when the, those videos were first uh, presented, I was talking to Gail Halperin producer of Bruce Wood Dance. And she said that going forward, uh, your company would include uh, videos uh, as much as they could. She thought of like one every uh, live performance, there'd be something like that. Um, so did you, what did you learn from this? And, and is it going to change Bruce Wood Dance going forward? Yeah, it will change. We, we learned how to create dance films and we hadn't had that hadn't been necessary before and we didn't understand that even though that was challenging and different that there was a benefit there and we've had enough virtual events at this point that we realize we're getting questions from overseas we're reaching people that couldn't travel to our exact location to be present for a show in a theater or a studio and we realize that that's something that we can share much more broadly and we need to create, we need to continue keeping that opening there for people that are interested in what we're doing. And now we know how to do it. And so we're, uh, we're happy that it pushed us to do that. I don't, I don't think we would have necessarily seen the need for that on occasion. You, you stream something or share some clips live, but we wouldn't have crafted something specifically for an audience to view in that manner um, had we not had this experience. Uh, we've had a few other things happen this year that would have never happened with our regular schedule. Our dancers um, got to choreograph on the company and on each other, those that are interested in choreography. Uh, we've just had some unique things specific to this time and this freedom with the lack of consistent performances popping up that we were able to do and to experiment with and to explore. And there's been some real benefits to that and some real learning. And so going forward, we're gonna continue with the best of both worlds. We want live, we want in-person, we want proximity, we want bodies in space together, but we also have to find ways to share what we do with people that cannot be there and are interested and are eager to experience something. Um, people that just don't have the health to come to a theater period, uh, minus the pandemic, people, that are far away and can't make it to the exact location we're performing, we have to have an offering for them. Um, lots of times you wanna take things in schools, you know, and share uh, with our education partnerships. We have to have ways to continue sharing dance in rooms that you can't dance in, in spaces that you can't dance in. So we've learned from that and we're gonna move forward with that. And Shelby, has any of your experience provided new material a new path new ideas um no i don't i don't know how much has really changed i think almost for me it's almost been a little harder um because i think how much i realized a lot of uh stuff that i kind of think about or come to comes from like just people watching or personal interactions so uh i think that's one thing I've, i realized i took for granted so much is just being in a public space with people and watching people go about their lives and do their thing and uh it's kind of, it was a little jarring. I thought, you know, I thought it'd be really nice at first and have this isolation, but you start to realize like even, even being alone in a crowd uh, has a, has a, a special feeling, you know, that, uh, that I'm kind of missing out on, I think. And to that end, your work at the Nashville Sculpture Center is on view for the public, people walking past can see it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was a, um, Right now, that's a, a friend of mine has another show up at the Nash right now that just opened last weekend. So I just want to make sure uh, people there's images and stuff. But I took it down about two weeks ago on the 29th, I think. Um, but yeah, I think so. That was it was kind of it almost felt too normal when I had that show and put work up and then I could know and people would text me or let me know that they went to go see. Uh, it wasn't too normal. I guess it was nice. <laughs> it just felt weird to, to almost be doing something 
it felt foreign but familiar at the same time you know it's just like oh i've done this a million times or however many times and it still feels different but it's still the same thing we have a, another viewer uh questions um what changes for you when approaching creating art without an in-person connection, um, either with your fellow performers or without an audience? How do you specifically think about the purpose of your art in a post-pandemic world? It's kind of hard to think of when, when all this goes away, um, what has changed for your, for your art? Um, Joy, you've talked a little bit about that because now you have this virtual access, you have this internet audience. Um, but has it changed um, what you think about the purpose of your art in live situation, in person? Yeah, I think, I think the dancers, the company, everyone is still kind of processing this last year. And I think there's going to continue to be work and uh, probably an abundance of creativity from all that time of like thought and solitude. Sometimes I feel like we're so busy that we're just jumping from project to project. And I specifically um, am beginning a new piece that will premiere at our June show. And it is about the effect the pandemic had on mental health, um, specific to the experience our dancers had. And, um, that work is, it wouldn't exist without this experience, you know? And I imagine that uh, lots of people will continue. Art is an expression of, of life. And so as, as we all continue to process and um, feel, okay, what just happened? What was that year of my life? And little parts of it, little beautiful moments. Some of our dancers said there was a calm and a slowing down that was so special. And I realized I need that in my life more. And other people uh, hated the isolation and, you know, craved everything but that slowness. And just looking at that and talking about it and seeing the effect it had on those who were already uh, struggle with mental health and, and what they needed and um, where human connection plays a part in our lives and really taking a look at that again and uh, creating something out of that. So I, I imagine we'll continue to see works that tell little slices of the story that everybody had this big pie of experiences this last year. And, um, and parts of that will be shared through art. All three of you have talked about this to a degree. I think many people might think that it's something that you know only artists feel um, the the need for an audience, um, uh, the need for that human connection. But uh, I know as as a cultural journalist, for me, it's been a disembodiment, a disembodied experience that only becomes emphasized with. Now that I've been vaccinated and I had friends who were vaccinated, we visited them recently just for drinks and talk. And it was so amazing, the normality and the rush of just being in a room with other people, just sitting around and chatting, let alone the idea of, you know, structured movement, structured speeches, drama, anything like that, anything to look at. We were just sitting around catching up. And that alone was so human and so real that uh, it amazed me that it, I hadn't done anything like it in 14 months, really. Yeah, I, I think that's really, uh, I think that's really interesting, Jerome. So, you know, the idea of like going to a public space and seeing people interacting with one another. Yeah, it's a thing that I have an experience outside of like, you know, going to a restaurant to get takeout, you know. Um, but uh, Nigel Newton, who was the composer and musician for the show, he's vaccinated, I'm vaccinated. And he just like, I, I, this is the first time it's happened in over a year, emailed me yesterday, said he had an idea for a project and we're gonna meet up at like a coffee shop outdoors. And the idea of like, I've, that seems so foreign to me, you know, to be able to, to be at a point where we could potentially uh, start doing that again um, is a, uh, exciting and, 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 and scary also. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Amy and Hosa uh, who asks, uh, ironically enough, I suppose, is there anything you will miss about this time when things are more normal? Is there something that you'd like to treasure? Like, gosh, I'm going to miss that. Anyone? 
I, I said to a person yesterday that I felt like we, we were a huge locomotive train that had come to a halt and now it's trying to get back up to like a hundred miles an hour again. And it feels a little bit feels like a lot maybe right now, you know, just because we had come to such a halt. And I said, wow, a little part of me is like, I miss COVID. I just miss that time, that time with my kids, and my family, and kind of that, just that where there was, you just weren't being pulled so many different directions. And a little part of me misses that and, and uh, understands that there's a value there and there's, um, you have to find a good balance even when things start charging forward again, like we like them to. I know one thing that I will, will miss that it, with virtual office meetings, I can say, oh, I have to go take care of the cat at the door and then leave for 10 minutes. And, <laughs> and you can't do that in the office. Um, um, Shelby, anything that, that you um, would? I mean, the other thing, maybe, something, maybe it's not something that I'll miss, but something that has happened with museums reopening are like scheduled uh, visiting times. And uh, to be honest, I, I don't think I'd have a problem with that continuing. Um, I think within the last few years, as museums have gotten really popular and Instagram and social media and stuff, it's almost like a, it's almost like going to the zoo, like you, while at the art museum sometimes. So it's just kind of like a, I don't I don't think I'd have a problem with kind of crowd control at more museums, kind of just maintaining a, a smaller audience all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I just think for the for the the experience alone of, of seeing artwork. It's really easy to be distracted by a picture all the time. So, um, so you kind of like the isolation in a gallery? Yeah, I think a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. Um, I just over two years. Not that it's a bad thing that people are going to museums. It's great and all, but at the same time, it really can't detract from the experience sometimes. So, mm -hmm. I'll be honest and say, you know, maybe a little bit of that crowd control isn't such a bad, a bad thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly, I know crowd control is an issue when you go to a, a big popular show and it's, you know, yeah. In twenty feet of of the work, that's that's an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe uh, yeah. I mean, and also that's the thing. A lot of those big blockbuster shows have been happening a lot more and more too. So, um, I think maybe maybe those won't happen as much. We'll see. It's kind of too Have you any of you been able to gauge public response to what you've done? I mean, I I realize there's there's probably some sense of thank God we, we were able to go see something. But beyond that, is there is there a sense of, oh, this is a lifeline or is this, we'll settle for this? I mean, it, it, is, it is weird getting just a lot of like with the show at the Nash I had recently, just most of my responses were all through social media, which is, is fine and I appreciate, you know, as much love as I can get, but at the same time, it's not the same as, is having a conversation with someone face to face, you know, with the work or, or things like that. But the reason I, the reason I was asking is that uh, you often hear about how everyone has transitioned to seeing everything on streaming, on Netflix, Amazon Prime, and everything. And having done that myself, it doesn't it doesn't it's not a substitute. Um, but are we willing to uh, settle for these little these little bits that we're getting? from him or as your audience said more yeah i think um for the cube you know this one this one project that i did um uh you know it was live and and because i you know i'm not part of like any kind of like um institution like i'm i was marketing and selling the tickets i'll do all of that by myself you know producing it raising the money um and so you know, I could see um, I was the person that people would interact with whenever they had like questions about the ticket buying process or if they enjoyed the show. I'm the one running all of the social media. And so um, uh, it seemed like people um, were responding well to it and they were getting they were surprised by the piece and some people were moved by it. Um, I, I don't know about it being a, a lifeline. Um, I don't know how um, how um, is replicable a word how easily it can be replicated by others, um, you know, because again, it's so, the piece is so um, kind of a specific to the moment and it was three people in a plastic cube. I think um, what some people might've gotten out of it, what other artists might've gotten out of it is this idea that there is a way to create live performance um, 
that kind of like breaks kind of like traditional, you know, preconceived notions of what life performance uh, can be. I think you'd be grateful when you're not answering all the ticket questions and then trying to handle all of that. Yes, absolutely. There is something to be said for institutional. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Joy, the audience yeah. response to to what Bruce Wood's been doing. I think uh, our audience was grateful that we found ways to offer them something during that time. I think we have our, our last virtual events, we put a poll at the end of the event talking about, would you come to a live performance, a moody performance hall this June? And the numbers were exceedingly, yes, yes, we want to be back there live. We want to see you guys live. Um, we'll have, you know, with safety precautions in place, are you comfortable doing this? And it was overwhelmingly yes and so uh i think even though they were thankful and they were happy to have some sort of engagement and it was important for us as an organization to show them that we were still working in creating content during this strange time i think we absolutely do need to get back to having that interaction with them in person i think something shelby said it's just not the same when you get that feedback virtually uh, a couple of our male dancers performed a duet as a guest company at Annette Strauss Square a few weeks ago. And one of the dancers said, bowing and hearing applause right there as I bowed in that space was just like, you know, just almost exhilarating, almost the surprise of experiencing that feeling again. And it's hard to, gratitude in words and on an email is wonderful but having those bodies in front of you and uh, feeling the energy coming across the space when you have a live performance or I guess a conversation after a show that you guys probably have, you know, it's hard to compare to that. It's hard to compare. And so um, that's what we're craving. And that's what we think our audience is craving as well. Uh, here's an interesting question, it kind of a reversal on things. Um, was there something surprising you learned about yourself and your art that you might not have learned otherwise? All of a sudden thrown in all this disruption, thrown uh, in an isolation, staying at home with family or not. Is there something that you learned about yourself and possibly about your art? Um, other than, boy, I need this. Yeah, I, I think I personally learned um, um, how uh, for a long time, I've always viewed my job as like an actor and a director and a writer. My job is to like remove, and I don't know where I got this from, but the, my, my job is to remove as much of myself from the process as possible. Like I don't want to impose anything on the text. I just need to be like this like clear vessel that kind of like character and emotion flows through. And it is my job to find the truth in the text, in the play, right? Um, this piece was all, not all about me, but it was about me and the performers and our personal experiences. And um, I I guess I learned um, A, how valuable that is and how powerful that can be, but also how, how scary it is and how I um, actively have been running away from that in a lot of my work um, forever. <laughs> um, and how, you know, I, I guess I'm starting to question how I can kind of like, um, tap into that a little bit more without it becoming, you know, navel gazy and self-indulgent. Um, but how I can um, give myself permission to um, allow myself to show up a little bit more um, in my work. Well, the cube was deeply personal. Um, even as it seemed disorienting at the beginning, it clearly, I mean, you put yourself out there. Um, is, is, are you saying that, that you're going to try and do something like that again, where you really pour yourself into a piece? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I will say like, I'm not a solo performer. Like I had never, I had never like said my words before on a stage. Um, this is the first time I'd done that. Um, I don't particularly like solo performance. It makes me uncomfortable both as an audience member and as a performer. Um, I don't know that I'll be doing that explicitly. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I was commissioned by Kitchen Doc to write a play right now and I'm writing, and there's a lot of myself that shows up in the play right now as I'm writing it. And Normally, I would, as I'm doing rewrites, I would go back and I would, I would cut as much of that out as possible because I never wanted the play to be 
about me. And again, I don't know where I got this idea, but I never wanted the work to be about me. And I'm giving myself permission to, um, uh, to see what happens, what, 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 um, I don't know what might present itself if I do allow some of myself to, uh, to show up in the work a little bit more. Joy, is there anything that you learned that you wouldn't have experienced otherwise about yourself or your, or your art? Yeah, I think maybe for me, it was just about our company. We really, we prioritize the dancers during this time, making sure that the, the weeks that their contract were, we fulfilled their wages and salary. We didn't just furlough them. And we, we asked them, we drew, we drew upon them for creativity coming back and ideas and kind of opened it up. How are we going to do this? And so it was a real period of resiliency and grit. And we know if we just pause, you can only press pause for so long before something kind of diminishes and stops and we refuse to do that. And so I think uh, it, a challenge that created creativity and just different avenues. And, you know, we, we talked to dancers about adaptability with their physicality and their, their range and all the styles and all the aesthetics they can embody. But this was like real adaptability in terms of mental and emotional drive and resilience and how, with all these obstacles that are kind of specific to our art form how can we figure it out and and do we love it and care about it enough and find it to be important enough to sit there and say we're going to figure it out um, one way or another and so it was um, a test and I think uh, us to see what you could make, what you could do with this thing you were handed that seemed an impossibility, you know, in some ways. And so uh, it really showed a lot of character and stamina on behalf of the staff and the board of the company and the director, you know, and Gail Halperin and everybody to say, no, we're not going to just kind of let this dissipate or just let the dancers go off and do whatever they need to do. We're going to figure it out and, and keep it moving in a direction forward, even though it might not look like anything we've done before. And I think that was a real kind of show of character for an organization. Mm -hmm. I, I like the expression of, of hitting pause for too long. Um, when speaking with the artists and arts managers the past year, uh, I would continually hear, the hardest thing isn't the isolation, the hardest thing is not knowing when this is gonna end. It's the doubt going forward, not knowing we can't make plans. We can't decide, oh, we're going to go do this for the future because there is no future. We don't know what's going to happen. And that was clearly, I mean, for the arts administrators where planning is everything, that is their job. It was driving them up a wall. Um, just being able to uh, focus on something and, and know that that was going to happen and they could do that was uh, a tremendous relief. Um, so yeah, eventually the pause becomes stop. Um, Shelby, anything that, that you learned that you wouldn't have learned otherwise? Um, I think for me, uh, I realized uh, the benefits of like a, a good routine. Uh, I think having that opportunity, kind of like setting that up and actually having the opportunity to do that because I work so many freelance jobs, a lot of it just kind of like getting work in when you can. Um, mm -hmm. I think having having the opportunity to kind of like have a, a routine or something that I kind of think that I try to do every day in a certain order kind of helped me with something that I haven't been able to do that as often. So um, I'll say that that was a nice little perk a little bit. But well, our, yes. sorry. So no, it's okay. Our time is, is up. Um, I'd like to thank our three panelists, Joy Bollinger of, of Bruce Wood Dance, Shelby David Meyer, the visual artist, Ruben Carzana, theater artist. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Dallas Museum of Art, um, Stacy Lazote. Um, we're gonna have two other state of the arts coming up, all of them dealing with aspects of the pandemic. Um, we're gonna be at one, the next one is gonna be at Fort Worth at the Kimball Art Museum on May 7th. And then the Greater Denton Arts Council will be uh, hosting us on June 17th. They're all virtual, they're all free. So you can come back and uh, see us then. Again, thank you very much, panel. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.